Fiat Body. And after that, we'll have uh, Professor Gerchev, and then we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. So let's welcome Professor Kismar again. Yeah, so if, if you've learned one thing from the talks today is that for those who are not, are not yet acquainted with Austrian economics, is that Austrians are very skeptical of fiat money. <laughs> so Austrians deny that fiat money provides any benefits, at, at least any aggregate benefits. Fiat money certainly helps to fill the pockets of some people at the expense of others. But there are no aggregate benefits, and fiat money actually is harmful to the economy because it uh, entails uh, business cycles, and economic crisis, waste of resources, and so on. So that is indeed today one of the most distinguishing features of uh, the Austrian school, and the, the opposition toward uh, government interventionism in the field of money. Traditionally, the Austrians uh, have emphasized uh, the two points that I just mentioned, namely the waste of resources and uh, the redistribution of incomes that result from fiat money. Uh, in my own work, I've recently uh, stressed uh, two, three, three other uh, negative long-run consequences. And I've done so in order to under underline that uh, fiat money is not uh, just uh, uh, harmful at the few moments when we get economic crisis, but fiat money entails long-run consequences that transform society in ways that most people would not welcome. <coughs> fiat money in particular entails not only a redistribution of wealth, but, uh, of incomes, but also of wealth. This is a topic on which I will not talk today. If you have questions on this, I, I might uh, answer this in the question and answer period. Uh, I have uh, published on this um, uh, uh, question, so there's a chapter in, in my German language book of last year, there's also a working paper on the internet. Uh, if, you, if you type uh, fiat money distribution incomes uh, wealth, you will find it, uh, it immediately. And this uh, working paper will be published in a forthcoming book <coughs> on the 100th anniversary of the Federal Reserve System. Okay. Now, I've also stressed that uh, fiat money uh, in creates a wealth income gap. So this is a subject that has been has made the news uh, a few uh, weeks ago with the uh, publication success of uh, Thomas Piketty's book mm -hmm. of uh, Capitalism in the 21st Century. So this is something that Piketty stresses a lot in his book. Uh, and so the, the figures that he comes up with are, are very interesting and uh, uh, he, he has been contested on the accuracy of his figures. <laughs> I'm, I'm not really well positioned uh, to judge this. I tend to think that the figures are probably correct. Uh, maybe not all of them, I'm, I've, I won't go into, into detail, but by and I think that the story is correct. Uh, where he's very weak is in the explanation of the figures. And in particular, uh, uh, Piketty, like most uh, economists, especially most uh, French economists, has difficulty seeing negative consequences in government intervention. <laughs> and uh, therefore tends to neglect the fact that it's precisely because of excessive government interventionism throughout the post-war period that we had this kind of uh, wealth income gap. Right? So that uh, the aggregate value of all wealth uh, becomes an increasing uh, multiple of uh, the uh, monetary value of annual production. And then there's also a third consequence that I've uh, stressed already in my book on the ethics of money production, namely the cultural impact of uh, fiat money. So it's the subject of uh, my lecture today. Now, in a way, of course, it's, it's awkward that economists would pronounce themselves on the culture. It's not typically what you would expect an economist to, to talk about. It, it, and it's true, uh, it's such a complex uh, subject uh, that economists uh, cannot uh, do uh, justice. So th th that is correct. On the other hand, uh, the things that I have to say on, on this impact are, uh, can be said, as you will say, uh, from an economic point of view. And we can say that uh, for, for these statements, we, it's entirely sufficient that we define culture in a rather general way as the way we do things. 
the way we do things, the, the way we do things, do the things that we do. Right? So, you know, we have we have lectures, right? We, why do we congregate in, in a room uh, like this rather than uh, outside? Why don't we have a video conference? We could have the same thing. Why do Bulgarians uh, like grilled meat? Uh, and they're not very uh, uh, great aficionados of the veggie uh, uh, cooking and, and, and so on, right? Uh, why do we uh, drive uh, cars of a certain sort? Why do we drive cars in the first place? Why don't we use more trains and so on? We, we prefer the bicycle, things like that. So the various things that we need to do, uh, feed ourselves, uh, transport, uh, communicate, and so on, we do this in certain ways, and these ways differ from, from one place to another. So that's, that's the question, right? This, is, this culture. And culture reflects our values and our choices. Uh, these values and choices depend on a great number of uh, factors, so we, we cannot, of course, uh, exhaustively discuss them. But uh, from an economic point of view, we realize that the choices we make and, and our values uh, reflect the totality of the circumstances within which we make our choices. And fiat money, what fiat money does is to change those circumstances in a certain way. So fiat money changes the payoffs and the costs of various ways of doing things. So fiat money therefore has a, an impact on the culture. It changes the way we do things. And this impact is of course not immediate, it's not as striking as in the case of intertemporal disequilibrium uh, of the sort that is described in the Austrian business cycle theory. Right? So there you have an, a boom-bust sequence that occur, occurs within a few years and possibly also within a few months. Right? You have an artificial decline of the interest rate, so too many uh, malinvestments uh, occur, and eventually the, the economy runs out of real resources and so you get a bust. Right? So this is a short one sequence. And the, the cultural impact runs uh, over much longer periods of time, it runs over generations, one, two, three generations. And I found it interesting to try to describe those consequences because we've been living under a fiat money system and we've been living with the expansionary uh, monetary policy for quite a while, uh, for over several generations. Uh, of course not fiat money in the, in the strict sense, this we only have since 1971 on a worldwide scale. But we had interventionist monetary policy for at least 150 years in all major Western countries. And you can trace this back to the very introduction of uh, the gold standard. The gold standard, the introduction of the gold standard itself, the classical gold standard, is a form of monetary interventionism. Because it's not uh, a situation of competing monies but a situation in which the government imposes one type of money, namely gold, which is not typically the medium of exchange that people would use in daily transactions. Right? It's very difficult to pay a cup of coffee with a gold coin. You know, whether you have already tried this, but <laughs> you will see. Right? So what people, the kind of money people use in those countries in which we use precious metals in the 19th century was typically silver coins and copper coins. Right? Gold was a a uh, way to save income, it was a mean of storing wealth, but not uh, a medium of exchange. So once you use uh, gold, then various consequences follow immediately because you cannot use gold in most daily transactions. Right? So you need some other thing that might replace gold in the daily transactions. So then the banks come into play. And so you see the introduction of a gold standard occurred, or can be interpreted, uh, as uh, a means in order to benefit the de development of the banking system. The gold standard benefits the, the centralization uh, of banking around central banks and so on. So this started uh, as from the 1870s and from then on all the various changes that have been made to monetary systems, both national monetary systems and uh, international monetary systems, always had the objective to increase the expansionist potential uh, of the monetary system. Right? Initially, under the classical gold standard, and therefore uh, libertarians today uh, tend to see this with a very, uh, uh, with, with much sympathy, uh, initially you had 
a great number of different banks that held uh, cash reserves in gold, so therefore the expansionist potential was limited. And then the systems that followed in the interval period, the gold exchange standard, and then finally the Bretton uh, Woods system, right, had increasingly concentrated a centralized uh, uh, cash hoards right, uh, around a few big international central banks, and then finally only the Federal Reserve System. And as a consequence, the expansionary potential of the monetary system has constantly been increased. And then finally, as from 1971, right, uh, uh, no more golden fetters for the monetary system, so the uh, monetary expansion could go on virtually unhampered. Right, so the bottom line is, is we had this kind of policy for a very, very long time. And actually, it did not only start in 1870, but I just mentioned this right, uh, as an example. We had this for, for a while, but it was particularly strong as from the 1870s, and then especially after World War I. So the cultural impact should be obvious, or should be um, uh, should be able to discuss uh, that uh, cultural impact. So what are the, uh, I will, in what follows, I will just highlight a few things that I think are uh, uh, quite characteristic of a fiat money culture. The first one is, of course, if we include politics uh, among uh, the culture in a way, of course, it is fine. Right? we get a, a centralization. The fiat money system always, as we know, right, benefits first users at the expense of last users. So the first users, of course, are those people who put the fiat money into place. If you have a national fiat money system, it's a national government. If you have an international fiat money system, well, it's an international organization. And so uh, the fiat money always creates a competitive edge of the benefit benefiting institution over all main competitors. On a national level, these were regional governments and, and uh, other social powers, so the gov national government gains a competitive edge. And now in the international level, right, we have uh, the, the, the same uh, uh, mechanism which works out for political centralization. We get centralization also within banking. This is uh, very well uh, established. I don't know whether some of you had a look at, at banking statistics, but if you, if you look at the number of banks uh, in the US, uh, in Germany, in France, I don't know anything, uh, Bulgarian statistics, but I guess probably you would find similar things, is that the number of banks have constantly decreased uh, since uh, uh, the interwar period. This is due to roughly two uh, influences. The first one is banking regulation. Right? So it's very difficult to set up a new bank. Right? So it's a question I always ask my students. Is, well, how many of you know an entrepreneur, somebody who has created his own company? There are various hands that go up. And then the next question is, how many of you know somebody who has established a bank? <laughs> no, no hands, right? This is, this is difficult. It's very difficult to set up a bank. This is the, the regulation kills, right, the establishment of banks. But then there's also, of course, another mechanism, which is the, the centralization of banking, because you can, you have a, a very strong economies of scale, especially in, in, in cash holding, uh, and also in uh, equity uh, ratios. Now, this is very technical stuff, but I'll, I'll leave it aside. But you see this very readily in the, in the statistics. And right? so the, uh, there's a very strong concentration, especially in American banking, but also in German uh, banking. French banking as well. Uh, so Deutsche Bank uh, today is as big as the next five banks combined. Okay, in, in the U.S. Uh, you have uh, J.P. Morgan, uh, Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs, and so on. Right? They are the, the four of them together are bigger than the rest of the banking industry. Okay, this is it's just very impressive, and it is a consequence of the fact that now they uh, seem to be in first in line when it comes to reap the benefits of an artificial increase of the money supply. A second uh, consequence still relating to, to politics is there is a tendency toward tyrannical government. I like to, to point out the, this fact because uh, people usually do not see the connection between uh, democracy on the one hand and uh, the monetary system on the other hand. There are various authors running around today who explain to you that uh, fiat money system is actually a great thing for democracy because right, the, the government can then finance various 
uh, welfare programs, uh, if necessary, with increased public debt. And the public debt is wonderful for the citizens because they can invest their savings. And so everybody is benefiting. This is just wonderful. And uh, I've explained to you already this morning that this is a very distorted view of finance. Uh, and uh, it was not this morning before in the first factor. Uh, and now I need to add that uh, there, there is, uh, in this process, uh, a mechanism that undermines the economic foundations of, uh, of democracy. This is an argument that goes back to the Middle Ages. Uh, we find it in uh, uh, Nicola Oresnes' uh, De Moneta. And it is an argument that I didn't find in uh, the later literature. I'm not a perfect uh, connoisseur of uh, the history of monetary thought, but I've read quite a, a few things and I didn't find it before Ludwig von Mises. So the next one who brings this argument up is Ludwig von Mises. And Mises states it in much more detail than uh, Oresme in the Middle Ages. He says the following. The economic foundation of a democratic government is control of the government through the people. And we have here the typical, uh, for economists, we, we know this as the principal agent problem. You have the agent uh, who is supposed to fulfill a mission for the principal. And so you have the government who is supposed to be the agent for the population, fulfill some missions. And the, the problem is to rein the, the agent in, to control the agent. And because we have, uh, information asymmetries and various other things. And so the agent always has the tendency to betray this uh, mission and to pursue his own projects, which are not those for which he or she has been elected. So this is the basic problem. Of course, right, there's been known since uh, antiquity, right, there's the famous, famous question that Plato has, has uh, raised, quis custodia et custodes, who watches the watchman? Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> this, is, this is a basic problem. So, what's the, so there is no real solution for this, but of course, uh, within a, de a democratic society, that's what, that was Mises' argument, the government is controlled through the budget. The government has a certain budget to fulfill its mission, and both is necessary. It's necessary to elect them, but it's also necessary to define the budget. Because it's not sufficient that a group of persons says, here I want to be your government, and this is uh, how I see how things should be done. So we should have a whatever, welfare system, we should have minimum, uh, wage and uh, unemployment insurance, it's all my nice projects and so on, so this is what I, I stand for, and then they become elected. Okay. Uh, once they become elected, the mission per se does not define the confines of, of government activity. Even if you have a strict minimum watch, uh, night watchman uh, state, right? so we only want to uh, pr uh, create security services, right? police, uh, judicial system, uh, and so on. This is all that, that we want to do. This per se is not sufficient uh, to prevent tyrannical government. Because the government, if, even if it says we want to just to create security for all the citizens, well, it can create uh, security for the citizens with one policeman per uh, 1,000 people of the population, with one policeman per 100, with one policeman per 10, with one policeman per 5, and with one police with a personal bodyguard for everybody. Okay. Of course, each time you increase uh, spending on, on this mission, you improve the product. Uh, there's no doubt about this, right? If you invest, spend more, then the, the quality of the product is, is increased. And you in, can equip your pol policeman with a knife, you can equip him with a knife and a pistol, and a pistol and a machine gun, and a pistol and a tank. Right? So it's, it's, you can always improve. Right? But then, of course, it means uh, if you don't define a budget that the government uh, if it's free to set its own constraints, well, it could absorb all resources within a society. That is, it could become tyrannical. So it's necessary not only to have the mission defined in the competing uh, electoral process, but you also need to define the budget. <coughs> and the budget, of course, is defined by legislation, like the government uh, needs to pass a law to increase taxes. Now, that's, of course, very unpopular, but that's precisely the test. Right? If you want to 
spend more money on this and that project, the government should say to the population, I need whatever, 500 billion more. <laughs> so I, if you elect me, I will increase taxes. And then if people vote for this uh, party or whatever it is, well, okay, so they again. Increase taxes, fine. <coughs> Now, fiat money allows the government to sidestep this democratic control. The government already uh, can start sidestepping this democratic control by getting into debt. Because then you avoid asking more taxes from people, you just get into more debt. Uh, but of course, if you just get into more debt, uh, there's a limitation somewhere because your revenue is also limited somewhere. So what fiat money then does is it allows for virtual unlimited increase of government debt. And that means, of course, that the control over the size of government is taken away from the citizens. And that's one reason why uh, being in the government is so popular right? and being so, so, so attractive, especially to people who want to exercise power. Because today, thanks to the monetary system, the financial system, uh, oh, yeah. it's not that there are no constraints, but you have a, a huge margin of uh, liberty that you do not have anywhere else. So the government tends to be uh, tyrannical, and then of course this has various uh, other consequences. Uh, for example, uh, um, people can no longer identify with the government. Right? Disenchantment with politics is something that we observe very widely right, in all countries. It has something to do with this. Now let's turn to uh, other uh, consequences. Uh, there, there are a whole group of uh, cultural uh, effects that spring from the fact that fiat money creates a debt economy, as I've explained before. And fiat money creates strong incentives to go into debt, that is, to, to take out credits. And it also creates very strong incentives to invest on the financial markets. Now what are the consequences of this, the cultural consequences? Well, one uh, important consequence that I've already highlighted in my uh, book on the ethics of money production is increased materialism. In a natural economic order in which a big part of savings would occur in the form of cash holdings, people do not need to watch the stock market and they do not need to watch, need to care much for uh, finance and financial news in the first place because they have their savings under the mattress <laughs> or in a, in a hole somewhere in the garden or maybe in a safe deposit box at the bank. And that's it. They sleep well, don't need to worry about this, and they just don't give much uh, thought about these things. It's very different in our system in which in order to preserve our savings, lifetime savings, we need to buy financial products. We need to buy promises of other people. So we need necessarily to become interested in what these other people do. We need to watch them. We watch the financial news. Even people who, well, are dentists or uh, shoe producers or, or prefer. So they, they start becoming interested in those things. They start the, 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 the evolution of the stock market. It is, it is quite remarkable. But it springs from this fact concerns everybody because everybody's savings are invested in such products. Another consequence <coughs> that follows from it is uh, a certain haste. Right? So there's a, a short, people are increasingly short breathed because they need to get done things quickly. Now this has something to do with a compound interest. Right? The earlier you, you invest, the better it is. Uh, you cannot afford to, to lose time because uh, losing time now means you renounce to revenue that you need to pay back your debt. So you become in increasingly interested in, well, making sure that uh, you uh, have access to revenue, that there's no risk, uh, you uh, try, try to minimize the risk that you lose your uh, job and so on. This is, uh, by the way, one factor that explains uh, the, uh, the movement uh, uh, of people going away from uh, the countryside to cities. Why do they go to cities? Because uh, you minimi minimize risks. Uh, there's always a job market in the city. Right? If you're indebted, you need revenue to pay back, otherwise you lose. Uh, so you go to the city because 
there's a, a, a lower risk that you might lose your job. There's also a lower risk for companies that they might lose uh, revenue, that they, they might lose customers, and so on. Another consequence is insatiability. People never get enough. Why do people never get enough? Well, because, uh, again, I confront this with a, a natural financial order, with a natural monetary system. People accumulate savings. There are more and more savings. If you, if you have more savings, at some point, well, uh, the, the return on investment will diminish. Uh, so this is a basic law of, of economics, right? The more you invest in any line of business, well, the law of return will diminish. Right? So the more we advance economically, the richer we get, the lower are the returns that we can earn by uh, investing our savings. So which consequences uh, uh, follow from this? Well, at, at some point, it's not, not, uh, really no longer interesting to look for another investment. Uh, we start subsidizing um, cultural associations, we spend all our time in clubs, right? Because it's no longer, it becomes less, it, of course, as a, as a young person, you always go for revenue, you want to have revenue and so on, but at some point you have accumulated a certain amount of wealth and then you're happy, right? some are not. Uh, at some point there's some saturation, right? And then people uh, are less interested in earning more money and they spend more time in, in the bar or <laughs> in the sports club, uh, whatever. Uh, this, so this is the natural way uh, for things to occur. I don't know, they, they buy houses, and, and the houses they buy for themselves, they buy a bigger house, and they embellish the house. And, and so the, these are the concerns, their own criteria that come into play. Things are different in the fiat money system. In a fiat money system, uh, you can uh, earn, right, this, this natural saturation uh, occurs either later or it does not occur at all. Uh, as we, so a basic mechanism of finance, as those of you who have studied some finance, is the leverage effect. Right? You, you can increase the return on equity by financing a greater part of your investment by more debt. So that's possible in a fiat money system to a much greater extent than in a natural monetary system because you have the central bank as a lender of last resort. And the central bank is likely to bail those people who are very leveraged to bail them out, especially if they are big enough to create problems for all others. So the point at which uh, returns on financial investment diminish comes much later or comes not at all. And uh, the uh, extent to which you can go into debt, that is, the extent to which you can leverage your own investment, depends on how much wealth you already have accumulated. The richer you are already, the more uh, securities you can offer uh, to back up your, your credit. Right? The bank will always ask you, uh, so what, what, is the, uh, the, uh, what, do, what do you have to, to back up the, the loan? You say you have a piece of land or a house or whatever. And of course, if you're rich, you have much more of this stuff in the first place. So you can take out more credits. And so the richer you are, the greater is the incentive for you, the economic incentive for you, to go on playing this. That is, and you have the exact reversal of the natural situation. The natural situation is that the richer people are, the less interesting it becomes to uh, invest and try to increase further revenue because the returns go down. Under fiat money system, the richer you are, the more interesting it gets. So therefore also the am amount of uh, money that we spend on uh, cultural uh, activities, unless it helps uh, within the, the marketing budget of our firms, uh, the, the amount of personal time that we spend on such activities diminishes because it doesn't pay. And there's a lot of money that we can earn by uh, uh, trying to, to get a yield out of our investments. So this is related to the fact that I highlighted uh, before when I said, well, the United States are actually importing capital, this importing savings from the rest of the world. Right? So there you have insatiability writ large. One of the richest countries in the world is actually importing savings from poorer countries. This is, is not the way it should be. Right? In a, in a well-ordered world, it would be the other way around. Right? The richer countries would have an excess of savings, and 
they will start then investing this abroad because they can no longer profitably uh, employ this within their own country. Here it's the other way around. And they absorb, especially in large country, uh, uh, capital. Another consequence, uh, cultural consequence, uh, uh, that I should like to point out is increasing indifference. Now that, that, that's a little bit uh, uh, trickier, but uh, I'll say it in the following way. Again, in a natural order, one way of using your savings is you buy houses. It's something, right? Because investments become uh, the increasingly low uh, returns, so you buy that stuff that is uh, important to you personally. You buy a house at the beach, you buy a house in the mountains, you buy a house abroad, or you to travel and so on. You do, do such things. The, or you buy a bigger house for yourself in your own country. Try to embellish this according to your own personal criteria. Right? So it must be beautiful and so on. Now in the fiat money system, of course, this incentive still exists, but there is now also another incentive that comes into play. Namely, if you invest into something, you do not only regard it as uh, uh, an increase of the amount of, of goods that you use personally. You consider it as an investment. If you buy a house, it's not for you. It's, it's a way of using your capital that you might uh, sell later. That is, you're no longer then trying to create something beautiful according to your own standards. <laughs> You're trying to buy or create something that is beautiful in the eyes of what you think the others find beautiful. That is, right, uh, it's no longer um, uh, important to have an, uh, to demonstrate excellent taste, but uh, to conform yourself to um, to what the average taste must be. And so the things that we buy, we're personally indifferent toward them, is we just consider them as a material bearer of our investment. It's no longer something that's of personal importance to us. And the same kind of attitude also relates then to our personal interactions, right? because uh, revenue becomes more and more important. So if we spend time with other people, it's no longer because we like them or they're friends and so on. It's also because, oh yeah, we need to build our network. It's good that I spend some time with this and this guy because he knows so and so. Uh, and so the so social relations become modified. I mean, again, don't get me wrong, it's, it's not we have the, the, this perfect communitarian uh, ideal uh, under national monetary order. Both motivations always exist. The point is that under fiat money system, the second motivation, namely using other people to promote your, your own ends or material ends, becomes more important. Then we have uh, uh, another type of consequence, which is um, uh, politicization of society. The bigger the whole economy is into debt, the more we become dependent on the errors of others. We observe this very clearly in the banking industry. So in the bank, if one major bank goes bust, Let's say if J.P. Morgan goes bust, well, the whole banking industry is likely to melt down. Right? Because the uh, failure of, of any one big bank right, is likely to, to uh, shake confidence on the one end, but also decrease uh, the money supply in the market. So we get a deflationary spiral that leads to the meltdown of the entire market. But in a fiat money culture, it's not just the banks that, I mean, they're excessively indebted, right? Banks operate often with equity of just uh, 5% these days. Before the crisis, it was often just 2%. Uh, so it's excessive. But, I mean, increasing debts, we observe them across the board. Households, uh, non-financial firms, governments, increasing debt. And so we increasingly get to the point, to the situation in which the banks already find themselves. If in a, let's say we are all as much indebted as, as banks are, then of course the uh, material well-being of each of us would depend on the errors of other people. So even if we ourselves do everything right, if somebody else screws up, 
right? the market might melt down, we will lose everything. So they, from this springs, of course, an incentive for, first of all, to watch what the others do. Right? You know longer different say, well, this is his private affair, this is my private affair, it's nobody else's business. No, it's no longer like this. Right? You say, well, yes, but this will have huge repercussions on me, so I need to watch exactly what this guy's doing. And plus, you have a strong material incentive not to address yourself to the government and say, well, you need to watch this guy too, and you need to regulate him. So the same tendency that we've observed in banking for the past 70 years or 80 years uh, is now slowly also uh, creeping in in other fields of life and for the same motivations. <coughs> increasing, right, this under the title increasing interdependence. Uh, this is a misstatement. It's not increasing interdependence. You can be very interdependent without uh, having a situation in which the failure of one element of the whole order it tears uh, the meltdown of the rest. Right? If everybody is financed 100% with equity, 100% with his own money, right? even if a big bank goes bust, there's a repercussion on its immediate customers, but not on the rest. Right? Even though everybody is interdependent, but right, the, the repercussion ebbs down. Right? It hits most the immediate partners and then diminishes as you move from there elsewhere. In a debt economy, uh, the, the in initial repercussion increases as leverage. So as a consequence, right, so we, we get a tendency to, uh, to work uh, uh, having increasing political demands toward the, the government. Then there's also an interesting phenomenon described by uh, Thorsten Polleit, a German economist, also of the Austrian school, and he has coined the phrase of collective corruption which is related to the point that I, I just raised. He said, well, uh, uh, individually, nobody has an interest in uh, demanding uh, to stop the fiat money system. We might very well see from an intellectual point, if, you, if we take part in an Austrian seminar, say, yeah, this is a bad system, right? It creates business cycle and it's all these terrible cultural features and so on. But now, our little personal individual self-interest is not to stop the system. Because if we do so, let's say we, right, you are what about 35, you've just bought the big house for your family, you have a lot of debt. Now it comes Hülsmann and says, well, you need to stop the fiat money system. If we do this, right, it means, well, your revenue will plummet. Okay, the whole thing goes past, and you still have a lot of debt. So you will lose your house. That's what it means. And if you run a company, or you've taken out, because you've adjusted yourself rationally to the system, which encourages debt, so you finance uh, a big part of your investment with, with debt, with a bank credit, and now we, we stop this system, everything collapses, you no longer have uh, no more credit available, plus your revenue diminishes, you will be caught, and you're done. Okay. Plus, uh, maybe you're not yet in debt, but you would like to buy the nice house over there. It was actually a nice house. Uh, but would like to buy the ni nice house over there. I would like to buy the big car. Your revenue is not sufficient. You can take on a loan. Now comes this evil Hülsmann guy and says, ah, we need to stop the system. No more bank credit available uh, for at least two years. Right. So each one individually right, is, so to say, trapped. Right? We have what economists call a rationality trap, which is created through the fiat money system. But it's very difficult to, take, uh, to get out of this. It takes a lot of courage. I don't have a good plan to, to solve this problem, but the problem exists. Uh, we have collective corruption. Uh, even though we might have, uh, it's, it's like if you, if you go to, if you're religious, you go to confession and say, yes, I, whatever, I, I lied and I, I, I cheated on my wife and, and, and so on. And, and, but then individually, you, know, say, you, you know what is a sin, but you still do it. I see a very strong incentives to do. Yeah, uh, then I, uh, well, I'll, I'll come to, uh, to conclude uh, by stressing one element in more detail, namely the, the, the problem of moral hazard. Implicitly, I already mentioned this, right? Moral hazard is uh, the temptation to, to try to uh, live at the expense of other people. And the moral hazard, in a way, is embedded in the very nature of the, of the welfare state. Right? Frédéric Bastiat, a great French economist, uh, once uh, said that the state is the great fiction 
through which everybody tries to live at the expense of everybody else. The state is the real fiction through which everybody tries to live at the expense of everybody else. And that's indeed what a welfare state uh, does. Right? The welfare state promises services to us and they, they, they are being paid by other people. And right? so the benefits are privatized, the costs are socialized. And then, of course, we have created the welfare state for banks in the form of a central bank. Right? So, so the central bank is the welfare state for, for bankers. Right? And so they behave accordingly. So the conse consequence is then in a debt economy that the economy becomes increasingly fragilized. And this is reinforced actually through um, uh, uh, bank regulation. Is the next step is always to ask the government, yeah, we need to regulate the banks because they do all these nasty things. They take too much risk and they have equity ratios that are too low. Uh, so the law needs to impose a certain behavior on them. Well, okay, so that uh, uh, sounds reasonable uh, in theory, but the fact remains that the incentive to behave uh, irresponsibly remains. Right? So people uh, go into more debt. So the economy is fragilized. Everybody individually takes less precautions because everybody relies on the central institutions to bail them out. And through the uh, regulation, <laughs> what happens is that people uh, uh, start to take the same type of precautions. For example, the, the, the banking regulation uh, pres uh, prescribes uh, that uh, banks keep their cash in a certain form, only in certain forms of assets. Either you have a bank account at the central bank or you have government bonds, they count as cash, uh, and, and such things. And so if you have the law that says so, then everybody behaves exactly the same way. Now this reinforces actually the fragility uh, of the economy. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll stop here, right? So we, uh, I highlighted so that uh, among the cultural consequences, there are more. Uh, of a fiat money system, we have political centralization, tyrannical government, materialism, haste, insatiability, indifference, collective cor corruption, politicization, and increasing fragility. It's not a nice washing list, okay? And it's, it's actually, it's a, it's a horror cabinet. And, and if you think of it, right, of course we observe these phenomena around us, it's very difficult to trace them back. Uh, also, uh, uh, quantitatively, it's very difficult to do this. I don't have a uh, good way uh, of doing this. But I think uh, uh, we, we can establish a causal connection between these different phenomena and the fiat money system. So if we reject fiat money, it should not only be because it wastes uh, capital. It does, so it impoverishes us. It certainly, it's bad enough. It's not only because it creates just benefits for one at the expense of others, but no overall benefits. It's also because it slowly destroys society itself. It uh, turns society into something uh, that resembles more and more a big machine, uh, not an association of free human beings. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we'll do another actual okay. okay. yeah. 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 question.